Hello, hi. Um, it's really nice to see so many people joining. Really looking forward to our discussion today. Uh, it's our London Climate Action Week event that's looking at um, enhanced direct access. Uh, what I wish I knew at the start. My name uh, is Clara Gallagher. Um, I'm a researcher on climate finance at IIED. Um, and uh, today we're going to be talking about one of uh, one specific mechanism that is uh, really valuable for trying to access climate finance uh, in a way that can help deliver locally led adaptation. Uh, this process is called Enhanced Direct Access or EDA. So as people um, come in, I'll introduce the format of our discussion today. Um, we're going to be having this as like quite an informal kind of chat. The idea of it is that it's a talk show and uh, we're going to be having some interviews, some reporting. Uh, I'm going to pretend to be a correspondent at some point. So you have that to look forward to. And um, we'll be all centering around this idea of what can be done to uh, get better access to climate finance to uh, the local level. Um, so we, we're going to be having this honest and quite frank discussion, so look forward to it um, and we can crack on. I'm, we're going to start with just explaining what enhanced direct access is, what is locally led adaptation, why, why am I here banging on about it? So locally led adaptation is important because um, as an approach it seeks to give uh, local stakeholders um, opportunities and support to really lead uh, adapting their communities to climate change. It gives communities on the front line um, of climate impacts a, a voice in decisions that directly affect their lives and livelihoods. Um, and over the last few years, quite a lot of momentum has grown around these eight principles for locally led, adapta uh, locally led adaptation, which can be used to, to guide those that are seeking um, to support LLA. Um, and there's um, some more information available about um, the LLA uh, principles that were kind of co-developed over quite a long time available here. Um, the typical way that, that climate finance is accessed at the moment through the major climate funds isn't, isn't great for LLA. Um, the processes are long, they're really complex, very difficult to understand and, and pretty top down. Um, Countries and local stakeholders are demanding greater efforts and commitments on putting more, more resources into the hands of local uh, adaptation priorities. And so one response to this is the mechanism called enhanced direct access that we're talking about today. Um, and it's a way that the Green Climate Fund and Adaptation Fund have, have kind of tried to develop to allow for devolved decision making, which is principle number one of the principles for locally led adaptation. Um, to, to have more localised dis decision making on what climate finance is spent on. Um, the process doesn't have to be contained to these two climate funds, though it's, it's a model that could be adopted by other finance providers. And the key elements of, of EDA are that the funds, uh, uh, the climate funds, so people like the Green Climate Fund, like the Adaptation Fund, they approve the, the mechanism that's used to disperse and monitor the use of the climate finance they give out. And so it's the process of fund disbursement that they're interested in, not whether they approve of you know, how, when, and where every last dollar of a, of a project is being spent. So that's the kind of the shift of what's different for enhanced direct access. And it, it takes that decision-making um, on what EDA, uh, on what the finance should be spent on away from the board level and, and to a, a more, devolved level to the national or subnational level. And that's um, uh, quite a, a big change from the way that usual projects are managed. It requires multi-stakeholder input on the plan for dispersing the funds. Um, a lot, there's a high emphasis on consultation and, and meaningful consultation in how these EDA projects are, are put together. Um, and it allows for a lot more country and context specific approaches and, and flexibility in the way that you um, choose how to um, disperse the finance, which gives more control to, to in-country entities. So really quickly, I'll just run through some of the key terms that you might hear in the discussion as we go through, so you can kind of stay grounded in the tech, in the, uh, in the terms. Um, 
so we have the climate funds. So we're talking about the GCF and the adaptation fund at the moment. And these approve the enhanced direct access projects that have been proposed by the direct access entities and national implementing entities. So these are entities that have got this status of having direct access to the funds and the ability to on grant the money to entities um, kind of in, in country. And direct access means that they don't need to have any intermediary handling the funds for the project on their behalf. They're, they're able to access them directly. Um, so they handle the enhanced direct access funds. They're responsible for complying with all the standards and guiding the executing entities. And these executing entities then is the next term. These are organizations that implement enhanced direct access with and within communities. And they can be all kinds of different legal organization depending on how each country wants to organize themselves. Um, there might be community-based organizations or national NGOs or the private sector or indigenous people's associations. And they work with the local communities themselves to build capacities in climate adaptation skills or project management skills as well, how to handle the funds, how to engage with external climate finance. And then all of this is overseen by um, another term, the National Designated Authority. So these are, these are the kind of um, overarching body that makes sure that all of the work that's going on aligns with what the country wants, what's kind of in, in their policies and laws and um, making sure, and they have a strong kind of uh, monitoring oversight and approval role in the EDA process rather than an, in, in a regular project. Um, so before we begin our chat, um, it'll be useful maybe just to frame this in terms of why, why are we talking about this? So, you know, if this is such a great way of delivering finance, how come it's still considered new and innovative and why is it not happening everywhere? Um, like direct access is a priority for the least developed country group, the LDC group, and enhanced direct access is also uh, essential to um, the, the LDC initiative for effective adaptation and resilience. And in part of this, they're seeking to have at least 70% of climate finance flows supporting local level action by 2030. And this way of moving finance around from the boards, devolving that decision making and then dispersing it onwards is one key mechanism that could support that um, long term aim. Um, but it's really difficult to manage. Um, it's really difficult to do. Um, the standards that you have to meet are incredibly high um, and it takes a long time to achieve direct access alone, but not even moving on to enhance direct access. Um, it also represents a shift in the way that the funds themselves have to work um, and the, it, for them to be okay with flexibility and um, with uh, having, you know, trust that the direct access, direct access entities are, um, you know, suggesting things that are right for their context and circumstances. And it requires a great deal of learning and learning takes time on how to implement um, EDA. So I hope that sets the scene. Sorry, it was a bit of a whistle stop tour to try and make up some time lost. But let me introduce Una Mae Gordon, the Principal Director of Climate Change in the Government of Jamaica and host of our LLA chat show. So I'm looking forward to this really informal and frank discussion. Una Mae, the floor's yours. Thank you so much, Clara. Lots of information this morning. Um, Morning colleagues, morning everyone from Jamaica. Good afternoon, it's, it's a sunny morning here. Um, Jamaica is known for chat shows and talk shows and, and all of that. So we are delighted to be in this space. Um, as you know, adaptation is really local and Clara set in the scene really very well. And locally led adaptation, as we know, and what we're talking about here this morning, will have global impact. If, if it is done correctly, but it needs this elusive climate finance that we all talk about, really, really elusive. Access to finance for us is a, a huge challenge as, as you hear Clara saying. And why is it so difficult still? I, I think enhanced direct access, um, I hear you saying there, um, it is long, complex and, and understanding, maybe a new acronym that we, we need there. Um, but this mechanism that was established to move decision making, move the decision making power 
of the funds, the adaptation and the GCF, and to bring it down to local level. But it still, as you said, remains really, really very hard. So this morning I have my very August um, team here with me and we are going to interrogate a little bit. I have here with me um, Man Ma Marianella, um, and, and I'm going to, to kick off with you, Marinella Foyle, and she's the executive director from Fund, Fund Corporation. Hi, Marinella, welcome into this space. And I'm gonna start Hi. with you. I'm gonna start with you, Marinella, and I'll introduce my other team members as we go along. Really going to start with you to, 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 to know, to understand, because there is no question that enhanced direct access can serve a purpose and be effective and in, the, in the access architecture. But early understanding and its modalities is really, really paramount to us. So I'm gonna start with you because you have been in this space, you have tried and you have some, some lessons to, to share. So I'll kick off with you on a question. What are some of the benefits that you see here? Um, really, just be, be very honest with us and, and to all. What are really some of the benefits that you see from this elusive mechanism still <laughs> here as, as we go along? And I'll hand over to you, Marinella. You have the floor. Share with us. <laughs> Thank you, Name. And I think you really used the uh, very powerful and uh, rightful um, adjectives there. Um, yeah, it is uh, quite an innovative and elusive uh, mechanism, but it's also such a powerful and effective mechanism. We have been uh, implementing a, a, a program uh, as, a, uh, as an entity of direct access for the adaptation fund. We have been implementing a program that evolved or, or was born as an EDA, even before EDA was named EDA. <laughs> So we have really learned uh, uh, from the process. It, it really is very uh, interesting because adaptation is about zooming in. And this is pretty much what the enhanced direct access is. So it's, we have a, a program where there is more than different, uh, uh, 40 uh, different executing entities. Usually projects are just one or two executing entities, but when you go down, you reach out to the local communities, you reach out and move the decision-making to the local organizations and identifying, okay, yeah, we need to you know, act in this, uh, or do these activities, adaptation activities or actions to, to, to reduce vulnerability. But you know, when they have the power to, the, to, to take the decision, you know, the how and the where perhaps it's, you know, it gets improved because it gets really to the local needs. Uh, and there, there's also more commitment among them on, on what to do and how to make sure that they are, they're improved. We had, uh, in, all, in all of our cases, we had more results than the before expected when the local uh, um, organizations were really committed. Uh, and that really makes a difference. Uh, the involvement and responsibility and, and, and the reaching out in, in, a, in, a, in a powerful way, uh, I mean, in, 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 in a farther way than, than uh, first expected. But, but Marinella, let me, let me hold you there a little bit. When you started, when you started this process, what did you expect to happen? Because are you well, are you where you you expected to happen? What were some of the surprises um, that you 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 got on the way in this journey to 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 get you here? Um, well, that's an interesting question because when we started, yeah, we were it was kind of a new mechanism, and we kind of said, well, we want to do it, but that there was not so much so many previous uh, experiences. We actually at that time uh, chat quite a lot with Sambi, which in in South Africa, where we we knew that they were kind of going through the same, and that was also very interesting for us on on saying, how are you? Doing it and what are, and, and, and we kind of share on the, our first uh, learning uh, lessons, but we we definitely were impressed on the results we got afterwards. They were a lot better than we thought. Uh, 
this is a process where you learn on the process? I mean, I know in general you say, well, yeah, you learn by doing and, and you you have to keep on um, working on the capacity building and everything, but this is it. I mean, you, you need to know that uh, working with uh, so many organizations with so many challenges, you need to do perhaps a lot more efforts on capacity building, on, 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 on developing mutual um, um, mechanisms on, on so you're learning too and you're evolving as a, as a direct access uh, organization but uh, it also means that the and, and you mentioned it and Claire mentioned it to the flexibility on on, on on managing the project uh, and, and the funding and everything it's very important because you need to to, to kind of understand that things I, I mean you have things in the way and you need to be actively, identifying them to improve them and to tackle them and to and, and, and Marinella, I'm going to I'm going to jump back in again because you 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 the flexibility one word we learned from covid is the pivot what would what did you expect how would you prepare differently what do you wish you knew at the beginning that that took you to the end what did you expect well i think that it's uh, uh, one of the issues is to understand, uh, to, to, to dedicate, I mean, let, let me rephrase it uh, differently. We are now in the process of scaling up. And, and now we have, we're really taking into the learning lessons because now we have the opportunity, now we know some things. Uh, so one of the things is put a lot more effort on capacity building of the organ local organizations to make, uh, and, and, a, and a better communication, back and forth uh, communication with different stakeholders. That is something very relevant to take into account. And another issue is really um, the, more than a follow-up or a monitoring mechanism, it's a growing up, mutual growing up mechanism. I mean, it, it's, it's a, yeah, yeah follow-up and monitor and everything, but understand that it's not just a, kind of a, a supervising kind of monitoring way. It's more like a, an evolving monitoring uh, and, 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 and growing up uh, together. Thank mechanism. you. Thank you, Marla. Let me stop you there. I'm sure our audience will have a lot of info, a lot to, to, to digest. Um, we, you pivot. I'm going to pivot straight into my next set of, 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 of participants. Makai, Makai, you have been in this space. Um, and as we know, you, we can't have direct access, enhanced direct access without direct access. It is impossible. So th this is the first step. And, and, and I want to ask you, Makai, what did you wish you know as one of the strong voice in the, in the finance architecture? What did you think, what, what would you say you wish you knew at, at the beginning? Yeah, th thanks, Unami, and I hope everyone can hear me. So I, I think um, just a step quickly a bit back is that one thing before we even, when we got into the process of getting direct access um, through the AF and the GCF, is that we were a part of the design of those two modalities. I think it's very important, um, and, and not a lot of entities do follow in intimate detail um, the, the policy um, sort of developments of the Green Climate Fund and the Adaptation Fund, but it gives you a comprehensive understanding of how things have you know, developed and, 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 and why certain things are in place versus why other things are not in place. So I think then to go to the, the question that you had, one thing is the magnitude of resources that are needed for a government entity to support accreditation. So we talk a lot about all the readiness that you get. Um, I can tell you for the fact, I think DOE at least at a minimum, we got 620,000 USD for GCF from, for, to getting our um, processes and procedures up to speed. Uh, and that didn't include all the time and the cost of the government staff and ancillary services that we would need to complement all of those um, consultants and what have you that would have been spent on that. So it's a huge undertaking. And, and I think government entities need to be realistic with their cabinet. I know at least our director will, was very frank with our cabinet um, to make sure that they had a clear understanding of that. I think another key point to look at as well, Uname, um, is as well, 
you having an appreciation as a small island developing state, developing country, that those that are in the multilateral climate funds don't necessarily have that understanding and appreciation of your local context. And it's actually your job as much as possible to, 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 ed, to be prepared to educate and educate in, in, in great detail. But I see you want to come in. That is, where, that is where, Makaya, the frankness of the conversation comes in that the, and yeah. the honesty, both at the local level, but also at the international level and, and the political leadership that is required with the honesty. I'm going to jump to Krista Joy because I think yeah. Antigone Barbuda is, an, is a, almost a model for us here. Krista Joy, now that you have this wonderful surf fund up and running in Antigua, and you had to crowd in a lot the civil society organization and the community-based organizations, what were the benefits from upskilling these communities? What can you share with us um, from, from where the surf fund is now and where you started? Okay, so right now, um, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thanks for your question, Uname. So um, with the SUR fund, um, we would have already provided um, a number of persons um, grants as well as loans. And um, this is for community-based organizations as well as um, households. Um, we're looking at vulnerable communities a lot um, to make sure that they're, they're able to actually like, be more resilient. So um, from getting the grants and the loans, we've seen that um, we tried not to make sure that they're, they're just getting grants to, for their buildings but we also want to make sure that we're building their capacity as well so that it can be more sustainable. So over time, um, before we even start projects with them, we try to make sure that there are a lot of workshops that are held with um, the applicants. So we go like step-by-step step through the process so that they understand what the grants process is. Um, we develop a lot of templates to make sure that they have the procedural manuals um, or guidelines. Um, they completely understand what it takes to provide a, a proposal from start to finish and then to actually implement their projects. And we also try to um, provide them with a lot of recommendations for service providers that could also assist them with completing their projects. And um, the workshops that we have for them um, would range from waterway management to climate change adaptation and the grant proposal writing workshops. And then from that, they're able to um, understand more about climate change adaptation, um, understanding the risks associated with it. And they can then go into their communities and not just um, build resilience, but they can also teach other persons. And from that, they can continue to have more projects and they can apply for more grants, more loans um, from other um, persons aside from just um, the Department of Environment. So we, we've seen that it's definitely improved um, their, their learning and their understanding. Excellent. And I, I think what you, you're saying here that it, it needs in terms of capacity, that technical, financial, and also the management of the risk as we see. I, I am going to, to run across now, way across to Mandy. Mandy, are you there? Are you going to join us this morning? And we know that partnership really is key to successful, to, to achieving success. When we, when we look for climate finance. And I want to ask you, Mandy, how do you, do you get the success in your approach to partnership? Thank, thank you so much, um, Uname, for the question. And I, I'd like to answer this, your question in a little bit of a roundabout way by sharing some recent experiences we've had. Because um, as Marianella said, Sandy began this journey with enhanced direct access a very long time ago. In fact, in 2013, the concept of EDA was born, it wasn't called EDA, but it was our proposal to the Adaptation Fund saying we can't do direct access unless we deliver finance into the hands of local communities themselves. And we began the project in 2015, closed out in 2020, which was just as COVID hit. Um, and we visited the project, there were, there were um, 12 of them in, our, in um, different areas in South Africa. Um, over the last couple of months. And there's some very interesting lessons that have emerged from those visits that I think are quite instructive for how we conceptualize partnerships, but also how we think about EDA. Um, and, um, you know, what was interesting about the visits was that some of the projects were amazing. They really were. Two years after COVID, everything is happening and more. And some were really disappointing. And of course, that what causes for us is to ask why. 
and what might we do differently if we're wanting to achieve a higher success rate. So just a couple of those things I think are quite instructive. First of all, we need a long time for implementation. Um, our projects were between um, 18 months and two and a half years because it took a long time to get the EDA processes up and running. Um, and so what that meant in a five year implementation period, there was only a really short time for implementation and it's not long enough if you're trying to do systemic changes, if you're trying to do adaptive management, those sorts of things. Secondly, process is critical. You've heard it from the colleagues. Capacity building, investing in institutional strengthening, investing in the non-climate change adaptation things are as important as investing in the climate change adaptation things. And I don't think the funds recognize that. They want to count the number of people who benefited or the number of assets that were invested in. Um, and they don't factor in that again, if you're wanting to close the missing middle, if you're wanting to do system, systemic change, it's those other things. How do you account for your budgets that are, are really critical? Then um, the third point, I've only got four. The, thir the third point is how easily compliance is misunderstood. Uh, you know, we're required to cascade really complicated, well-intended directives from the funds often in the form of their safeguards to the ground. And when they hit the ground, they often result in maladaptation. And I think there's quite a lot to be said about uh, reinterpreting the way we apply the safeguards. No one means for things to go wrong, but they have and they do. Um, and I think we need to have a frank discussion about when a board member says, we need to mainstream gender into whatever, whatever, Let's look at what it really means on the ground for how we resource I, I, our, Mandy, our work. I'm going to I'm going to shoot another another question because I, I I hear you saying, as we all know in this space, that we really it's a long term effort, a real real long term effort, and that the if we're talking adaptation, it has to be local, and and therefore the build out of the type of partnership, it's everybody's business. Um, and, and, it, and it's everything all wrapped up, not just the focus on climate change. But I, I want to ask you specifically and honestly, if you are to change some aspects about at the beginning, because we are looking, if you had to change anything at the beginning, and all of what you're saying now is what you learned, if you had to change anything at the beginning, what would that have been? I think I would change two things. I'm going to be cheeky and say two things. The one is I would change expectations because this work is very difficult. Um, and I think that if we sugarcoat it and pretend that it's easy, I think we will create a misunderstanding around what it takes to do this and what it takes to resource this. And then the second thing, you need the right intermediary partners. Because for climate finance to get to the ground, the local communities need to have partners that were there before and that will be there after. You know, when we talk about sustainability, we need to practice sustainability before the projects close so that when they close, the intermediary partners are still there to help solve the things that inevitably go wrong. So I think it's all about partnerships, actually. I think it's about putting the right kinds of partnerships together in a way that we really, really build local agency for this work. Um, and for that, it needs to be uncomplicated, it needs to be easy, it needs to be all these things. And sadly, in the climate finance space, I think if we were to bring the Sanby Enhanced Direct Access Project today to the climate funds, I don't think it would be funded. Because I think the funds so have so made so it- So Mandy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. I'm going to jump in again, Mandy, and you can look me straight in the eye, look straight in the camera. And if for somebody out there in the space that is going to begin this process and is in that position to start this process, give me one thing, just one in one little sentence, what would you tell that person? And, 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 and you can. I would, I would say it's worth it. Do it because the transformative difference it makes on the ground is profound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mandy. All right, so audience, you have heard from, from, from all my panelists, you have heard from all my speakers, no, no holes barred here. So we did some research and I'm going to, we had a correspondent um, that went, went, went about and you have heard from everybody. I'm and I'm going to bring back 
Sylvia or Clara, and I'm going to bring you back to, to just give us a report. What did you hear from, as a correspondent on the road, what did you hear? Give us, the, give us that report and a recap from the recent meeting that we had. And I'll bring you in here so that you can, you can say, and you can dispel some of the myths that we, we heard or some of the honesty that we heard here. Thanks, Uname. Um, so yeah, as, as you're saying, um, Sylvia Mancini here, you recently hosted a workshop on EDA. Um, so do you just want to tell us quickly what happened and what kind of entities participated? That's great. And I will not stop the honesty here. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, so absolutely. So from the from the Mandy project and long way uh, up to really hosting a, a workshop, the adaptation fund in uh, cooperation with the uh, Fundo Cooperación para el Desarrollo Sostenible, and uh, has organized a three days workshop on uh, enhanced direct access in Costa Rica from the twenty. 1st to the 23rd of June. So we recently uh, came back. This is very recent. And the, uh, the workshop was attended by the national implementing entity, by designated authority that wish to uh, start the accreditation for the second NIE in the country. And also from representative, of course, from the existing uh, EDA projects that presented their uh, experience with EDA and also some executive entities. So it was a, a great experience. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And, um, and, and what were kind of the strongest themes then that, that came out of the workshop? Well, I believe I, I continue with what already is said, but definitely uh, one of the one of the, the the feeling that we got was really the, the increased country uh, ownership with regard to the project activities that really strengthen locally led action adoption uh, sorry adaptation and the strengthen institutional and really individual capacity also sub-national level. So really the strengthening of locally led adaptation at all levels is, has been very key. Now, uh, of course, we at the Adaptation Fund are, uh, in, are doing, are developing the medium-term strategy for the 2023-2027 period. And uh, let me tell you how locally led adaptation is considered definitely a key area. And of course, EDA has been a specific uh, category of, uh, of locally led adaptation. Uh, so I believe that all of this, uh, all the experience that we have had in Costa Rica, in terms of knowledge sharing, and in terms of all the, all the elements that you brought up uh, uh, on all of those wonderful words that you mentioned, flexibility, partnership, sustainable, capacity building, all of that was part of the workshop and it will be considered also in the medium term strategy of, of the adaptation fund. And, and when you're going through these processes we, and, and then reflecting at the workshop, were there ever times when you're like, oh, we're surprised by this? Like, <laughs> you know, what I wasn't, I really wasn't expecting this to come out as an answer. Is there something then that you can, you can learn from this? this moment and uh, kind of reapply it um, in, in your processes going forwards, you know, with the Adaptation Fund being an endorser of the locally led adaptation principles. Yes, one of the, I think one of the beauty of the Adaptation Fund is the, uh, a number of staff of the IF have been there for a long time to see also how uh, we went from the experience of all of the, even the EDA, how it matured over the years, of course, in conjunction with the direct access. So I was, we have been, we call it in the Adaptation Fund, a family, a community. So we have always, uh, the surprise is almost never there because we know it all from, from all of us, but this time we continue to be uh, really surprised by the commitment that the national implementing entities have with regard to locally led adaptation. So really to how the demand for adaptation, adaptation of financing is higher and how the national implementing entities have uh, responded to to this commitment, you know, to the commitment and to this, uh, uh, you know, request of engagement. So we have 
at the level of the of the adaptation fund so we have uh, opened a window in uh, 2020 the board has approved uh, a 5 million per country fund with, which will be additional to the 20 million uh, per country so it's uh, outside of the cap and this of course will really provide an opportunity for for a national implementing entity to do what you are requiring in terms of capacity building and so then to design and implement their own project through uh, locally led uh, actions that's that's great so we've heard then from our from our correspondence interview that uh there's there's a lot of emphasis being put behind this program and that this the people are, are committed to making this work but we'll go back to Uname and our um, other interviewees to see what's resonated what's familiar what's what's uh needs some tweaking um i'll hand back over to you Hi, Uname thank you clara and i see we we have in the chat here this issue of the climate rationale um, really a, a, a issue, and, and I heard you, Sylvia, but I'm going to ask my, my interviewees now. Really, really, you have heard from the correspondent report. Um, usually, these are no holds barred report. You stick the mic in the face. But what I, I, I want to ask you, what resonated most? You participated in this. What resonated most um, with, with each of you? And I'm going to ask you. Um, if you had a magic wish, this one, one that we raised to, to change something about the rules you have to follow, about the climate rationale set by the fund to access, what would that be? I, I'll start with you, Krista Joy. Thank, thanks, Jenome. All right, so, um, well, I, I don't know, I would say in terms of providing for persons, it's good for countries in general to be able to have this enhanced direct access. It's definitely helped Antigua and Barbuda because then us being able to choose which projects that we want to um, we want to select um, at the local level, it, it makes it easier for us. Um, and then from there, the capacity that's built within within having those those projects and giving the locals the opportunity to build their own experience um has definitely been improved so um but i i definitely agree i saw the comments in terms of the climate rationale and and i agree it is a bit more difficult um going to these um projects um and, and sub submitting our concept concepts so we hope that um um as as the gcf and the adaptation fund um, are listening to the smaller islands um the smaller developing states that were able to um to change what those climate rational requirements are keep over to you marinello and, and ask you the same set of questions what what is resonating with you from from this and and if you if if i wave my magic wand to you as well which i have here in my hand and zap you what would if you have to change some of the rules what would that be um the and we're talking here now we have sylvia from the eighth but we also have the gcf what would that be what would it be that you would want to change yes that, that is a great question um i would say that really check on the mechanisms that are set for e, uh, for eda in terms of uh the rules and formats and criteria that are being used to promote eda because somehow when you when you look at the 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 you know the documentation needs to be filled out and the criteria and all, it still seems that it's like you want a round thing but you're trying to stick a square on it so you you still need to see what the square looks like so let's make it round and then so we have a, a a good mechanism or rules and criteria and formats and everything so you're really promoting eda that that is my wish <laughs> <laughs> uh round hole in a square peg we know that will not work so a lot of work still needs to be done mandy if i ask you the same set of questions and i wave my wand and zap you what would that be <laughs> So Olume, I'll answer this question maybe slightly differently and say that I think what is needed is for the direct access entities to have core support. Because I think that if the direct access entities are properly capacitated, they can problem solve. Um, whereas at the moment, direct access entities get their resourcing mostly from, 
from fees earned on projects that are approved. Um, as you know, in developing countries, there's not a lot of spare money to keep creating extra posts for these sorts of things. And I think, think that's a huge hindrance to building the institutional capacity at national and subnational level to um, sustain this work and to create the systems that are needed to make it happen. Thanks. For support, and, and, and we had this, I am the chair of the Board of Governors of the five C's with a direct access. And yesterday we were talking about core support. Makai, I am gonna come back to you and ask you same question, zapping you with my magic wand. What would that be? As one I, of the strong voice in the in the climate finance space. I, I think I think one key thing is a, allowing the direct access entities who are given devolved authority to actually execute their devolved responsibility. There's a lot of basically, you know, babysitting and 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 over um over over regulating direct access entities. And you would never see that happen with an international access entity. So I think I think on comparison, the board, the, the secretary's application sometimes of the, the board approved policies. Uh, have, be, have become so draconian in the case of direct access entities. And it's simply because, to be frank, they, 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 they don't trust. Um, and, it's, and it's a perception thing, right? And a lot of it has to do with because we're based in developing countries. And, and this is us being frank here, you know, and this, it's obviously speculation, uh, but it's, it, it, it's, 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 it's too much of a correlation. And maybe it's because a lot of the secretariat staff and, you know, and a lot of the, the bigger funds they, they really and truly it's a revolving door between them and the MDBs a lot of the time and you know so 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 the understanding of the context um it, it really is tough a lot and and I think it's our job as direct access accredited entities as much as power that we do have to make them and educate them on the local context and, and this is why it's so important to be at the board level and at the cop level to, to be there and be a part of adopting those policies because then you can tell them no 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 that's not the case because I was there when the policy was adopted and it's just a misinterpretation and misapplication. I think one last thing, Una, is that the GCF, in the GCF's case, international accredited entities, and I think it speaks to the point of what that Mandy was saying, they have an obligation to support building capacity with indirect access accredited entities. I'm currently supporting a lot of the GCF board members, the CIS board member. And every time I look at the reaccreditation application on that part of their accreditation, it is so wishy-washy and generalized and doesn't say exactly how they are building the capacity for direct access accredited entities. And they should be ashamed of that. And we need to put them to task. And I know at the next board meeting at the GCF, there are quite a few big international accredited, acts, uh, in, international accredited entities that the SIDS, the SIDS board member and a lot of developing country board members are gonna ask what exactly are those next steps that you're doing to increase the capacity, as Mandy is saying, because we don't get that core support. And they have an obligation and a duty of international accredited entities to do that. So I'll stop there, Una. I, 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 we could have this conversation, Makai, strong language, draconian. There, It is a trust issue, and we fight for continued trust in the system um, and transparency in the system. But as you said, there is this strong correlation and the revolving door. And, and I, I think as, as we continue this discussion, um, the, 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 the going, going forward, um, the design, um, we, we, we heard Sylvia, a few questions are in the chat and I am encouraging my, my interviewees to, to enter the chat and answer some of them because the participants here, I think, um, unless we continue to have this honest conversation, real honest conversation about what is going wrong and what is going right. Um, the, I, uh, Sylvia, you, you said that the adaptation fund is, is a family. <laughs> it is a family fund and, 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 and you said one of the beauty of the adaptation fund. Some of us in developing countries use that language too. And you want to, I'll give you one minute to elaborate a little bit about the beauty of the, 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 a, the AF so, so that we, we can all understand a little bit more. And from what you hear from Makai and the rest, what else? <laughs> Thank you. I really cherish this one minute. So let me just tell you 
uh, we learn from the actions that national implementing entities are taking on the ground. Let's not forget what Mandy said. This came from a proposal to the adaptation fund. So from that, there was a learning, there was a maturity. And you know, the word that you use, flexibility. I am in charge of the accreditation, reaccreditation process for the for the adaptation fund. Let me tell you the endless discussions that we have had also when we started the, the streamlined accreditation process, which was the core of the, the country driven, I don't want to use the word approach, but the country driven request for, for listening, what Mikai is mentioning, you know, for, for really building up together something. That is what we mean by, by, by family, by really understanding the needs and trying together to, uh, to, to do, uh, to have uh, adaptation actions that make sense at the country level. So definitely the locally led adaptation actions, they do make sense. And that's why the adaptation fund is so engaged with, uh, with this uh, mechanism. So this is what, uh, you know, if there is a word that I have learned in the fund is really listening more than more, more than anything else and we try to really uh, we try to really do that and uh, i hope uh, even in the in the costa rican workshop when i said we organize this in uh, cooperation with funde cooperacion sometimes has been all the way around funde cooperacion organized this in cooperation with us really there has been there has been a lot of uh, a lot of exchange and from that exchange we learn also as a fund and uh, and the board is extremely uh, responsive through thank you, all thank the you windows very much, that they we are running out of time here so okay. i'm going to just so that we we are respectful of all and and we continue to build the trust across the platform so we are <laughs> gonna end soon but I, I just wanted to to shout out about some of the things i'm hearing here this morning flexibility scaling trust um accountability partnership quite a bit of and and a, a big one that came out is if we knew at the beginning some of the things we know now i think we continue to share across region um if the, the, these lessons learned i i think i, I think mandy you had said that you we and, and marinella you were looking at the south africa model so just sharing across as we continue in this space um the strong language used by makai um about the over regulating and and the revol this revolving door that the fund is set up to to serve but it is it is still a bank and and therefore you have to prove yourself i'm going to to stop there but i think as we go forward i think we will continue this conversation we will continue to fight as developing countries as you know and in in the final analysis we believe that the enhanced direct access modality is a mechanism that can work should work and and must benefit the countries but most importantly must benefit the local communities so that we leave no one behind i'll stop here thank you for being in this space with me and clara i'll hand back over to you so you can you can tell our audience how they can get the results of this 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 program and how what else as we move along thank you all i'm out thanks a million what a great session it was so good to have this frank discussion and to have some uh yeah real good honest chat about some of the difficulties as well as the many strengths that we can see coming through and and the dedication and kind of political interest as well behind making this work because we see the benefits that it can have for locally led adaptation. I've put some links in the chat there and I've been putting links to everybody's work as we've been going through. So I hope you can uh, continue to draw on those resources and we'll follow up with a recording of this video for everybody that, um, that uh, registered so you can forward that on to your colleagues and networks. So please stay in touch, follow the links and you're welcome to get in touch with us anytime. All right, thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of your day and a huge thanks to our panelists for this discussion today and for um, Matt who is keeping everything running smooth on the tech front. Have a great rest of your day. Bye everybody. Thank you all.